name is Brian Parks. I serve as the senior pastor here at Covenant Hope Church. And before I begin with the sermon today, I just want to give you a brief update. Some of you may know that uh, one of our four daughters uh, has been pregnant, and she was due sometime in the middle of September. And lo and behold, she had an emergency C-section on Friday night. And everyone's doing well, baby's doing well, Sarah's doing well, uh, but Joanne and I have made some plans uh, to go back immediately tonight. So we're traveling back to the U.S., we'll be gone for this week, and we'll come back at the end of next week. We'll also possibly have a chance to visit Joanne's mother, who has in, been in the hospital lately for uh, some compression fractures in her back. So we appreciate your prayers for us as we go, not for safety, but for Uh, us to be able to minister to the people that we encounter, our family members and anyone else that we come across in our travels. We want to be um, ministering to people, sharing the gospel and building them up. So we'll turn now to our text. We're in the book of John in chapter 19. The famous Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote a series of essays that were compiled in a book titled God in the Dock. God in the Dock. Now, you may not be familiar with the way he's using that term, dock, but the dock he's speaking about means the witness stand in a courtroom. He writes in one of the essays in that book, And I will change some of the terminology just to make it super clear to you what he's trying to say. C.S. Lewis tells us, the ancient man approached God or even the gods as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are quite reversed. He is the judge. God is on trial or in the dock. Modern man thinks of himself as quite a kindly judge, if God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war and poverty and disease, he's ready to listen to it. And the trial might even end in God being acquitted. But the important thing is that man is on the judgment seat and God is on trial. C.S. Lewis was making a point about the worldview of modern people, seeing themselves as the judge of God rather than the reverse. But there was a time in history, a very crucial turning point in all of human history, where sinful men literally put God on trial. Jesus was the humble King of kings, the judge of all the earth. He took on flesh and came into our world, holy, pure, innocent. Yet the Jews and the Romans conspired to put him on trial with the verdict already decided, guilty. That's the scene we find in our passage today in John chapter 19. It's not just a lesson about injustice. Of course, it is unjust. But God is doing something in this trial, in the crucifixion then of Jesus that follows it, that is quite literally the most important thing for you to consider in your life. Jesus, the innocent King of heaven, unjustly judged by sinful man so that if anyone could would recognize their sin against God, reject their own sin rather than God, and then put their trust in Jesus, the God-man. They can be declared innocent in heaven's court. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 19. You'll be helped to follow along. We're looking at the first 16 verses or the first 15 verses and then a half of verse 16. We're going to stop probably there where the paragraph break is in your Bible. And what has come before this, of course, is Jesus being brought not only first to Caiaphas, the high priest, but now in the last passage, last week, 
Jesus has been brought to Pilate, the Roman governor there in Jerusalem. The Romans, of course, were ruling over Israel. They had control. And in order for the Jews to carry out what they wanted to do, which was to execute Jesus, they had to have the Romans do it. They were barred from passing a, a judgment of execution on anyone while under Roman rule. During the initial questioning that Pilate uh, does with Jesus, he asks him, are you a king? Because that's the accusation that the Jews first leveled against Jesus to Pilate. They thought a political accusation, an accusation that would perhaps make Jesus a threat to Caesar, who they believed was the true king of the entire empire, that that would lead the Romans to put Jesus to death. Jesus speaks to Pilate, and he doesn't say whether or not he's a king, but he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And at the end of that initial questioning by Pilate, Pilate offers the Jews a favor that he always gives on the Passover weekend. It is the Passover weekend, you'll need to remember. The time that commemorates when Israel was rescued from Egypt 1,400 years before this time that we're reading about. Moses led them out when they sacrificed a lamb, each one of the Israelite families, and they brushed the blood over their doorposts. And the angel of the Lord passed over their homes and caused the firstborn of every Egyptian family to die. It was that that led to their rescue. It's that weekend that they're commemorating. And Pilate offers the Israelites to let one of the prisoners go. Who's, and he offers up Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist, someone who had quite literally rebelled against the Romans. But the Jews call instead for Jesus to be crucified and for Barabbas to be released. Follow along with me as I read the first 16 verses of chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I, I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and he sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Let's go to the Lord in prayer 
Oh, Heavenly Father, you tell us in your word in Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Praise be to you, Lord, for your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What I want you to see in this passage is that Jesus is our innocent heavenly king rejected by man. Jesus is our innocent heavenly king rejected by man. The outline for this afternoon for the sermon is going to involve four points, and I'll tell them to you as we get there. The first one is the mocked king, the mocked king, and we see that in verses 1 through 3. The first thing we read in this passage is about this abuse of Jesus, this flogging, the beating and mocking of Jesus by these Roman soldiers. Now, there were three types of flogging that the Romans punished people with. And based on reading John's account, along with the other three Gospels, Bible scholars agree generally that it makes sense that this was the lightest form of flogging that Jesus initially experienced. It's called fustigatio. The other Gospel accounts lead us to believe that Jesus would then have received the most severe flogging just before he was taken to the cross. So just after this passage that we're going through today. And John doesn't record that flogging, the worst flogging, the one that oftentimes killed people in and of itself before they even got to the cross. Still, this beating, of course, would have been brutal, even if it was the lightest kind of flogging. And John makes especially sure that we know how the soldiers mocked Jesus. The crown of thorns would have been from date palm branches, which could have had thorns that were up to 12 inches long. And we can imagine that they would not have been gentle when they put that crown of thorns on his head. The crown of thorns would have been forced onto him, surely piercing his scalp in multiple places and bloodying his entire face, perhaps running down onto that purple robe that they then put onto him. And of course, they put that purple robe on him to mock him because purple was the color of kings. And then there were those mocking shouts of the soldiers, Hail, King of the Jews, perhaps as they bowed a knee. But we can imagine them bending that knee in hatred and scorn and then slapping him in the face as they rose up, punch after punch, slap after slap, laughing the whole way through this beating. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, he tells the gospel story through a tale about a great lion named Aslan who is the true king of the imaginary land of Narnia. The white witch, who is the satanic figure in the story, has taken a young boy captive named Edmund. Edmund had betrayed his friends and Aslan, the king. But Aslan has made a deal with the witch. He will give himself up to her in exchange for the freedom of the boy traitor named Edmund. Edmund's sisters and brothers watch as the great lion Aslan turns himself over to the witch and her wicked army. And this is how C.S. Lewis describes it. A howl and a gibber of dismay went up from the creatures when they first saw the great lion pacing toward them. And for a moment, even the witch herself seemed to be struck with fear. And then she recovered herself and gave a wild, fierce laugh. The fool, she cried. The fool has come. Bind him fast. Lucy and Susan held their breaths, waiting for Aslan's war and his spring upon his enemies. But it never came. Four hags, grinning and leering, yet also at first hanging back and half afraid of what they had to do, had approached him. Bind him, I say, repeated the white witch. The hags made a dart at him and shrieked with triumph when they found that he made no resistance at all. <laughs> 
Then others, evil dwarves and apes, rushed in to help them, and between them they rolled the huge lion over on his back and tied all his four paws together, shouting and cheering as if they had done something brave. Though had the lion chosen, one of those paws could have been the death of them all. But he made no noise, even when the enemies, straining and tugging, pulled the cords so tight that they cut into his flesh. And then they began to drag him toward the stone table. Stop, said the witch. Let him first be shaved. Another roar of mean laughter went up from her followers as an ogre with a pair of shears came forward and squatted down by Aslan's head. Snip, snip, snip went the shears and masses of curling gold began to fall to the ground. And then the ogre stood back and the children, watching from their hiding place, could see the face of Aslan looking all small and different without his mane. The enemies also saw the difference. Why, he's only a great cat after all, cried one. Is that what we were afraid of, said another. And they surged round Aslan, jeering at him, saying things like, kitty, kitty, poor kitty cat, and how many mice have you caught today, kitty? Would you like a saucer of milk, little kitty? Oh, how can they, said Lucy, tears streaming down her cheeks. The brutes the brutes, for now that the first shock was over, the shorn face of Aslan looked to her braver and more beautiful and more patient than ever. Muzzle him, said the witch. And even now as they worked about his face, putting on the muzzle, one bite from his jaws would have cost two or three of them their hands, but he never moved. And this seemed all to enrage all that rabble. Everyone was now at him. Those who had been afraid to come near him even after he was bound began to find their courage. And for a few minutes, the two girls could not even see him. So thickly was he surrounded by the whole crowd of creatures kicking him, hitting him, spitting on him, jeering at him. Hundreds of years before this moment in John 19, Isaiah wrote the inspired words of God in chapter 53. Words like, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Brothers and sisters, this is our king of glory, willingly receiving the mockery and abuse that our sins deserve. This is the commander of the armies of the Lord, the one who could have snuffed out these soldiers' lives in an instant. And yet he didn't. J.C. Ryle says of Jesus here, Our Lord was clothed with a robe of shame and contempt that we might be clothed with a spotless garment of righteousness and stand in white robes before the throne of God. What these soldiers cried out to mock Jesus about was really true, wasn't it? He was the king. Oh, had they known. And Jesus' patience and submission to this abuse is not only what makes him so admirable, so glorious to us now, but it also serves as an example to us for those times when we might be suffering unjust punishment. I pray that none of us ever have to have that experience, perhaps to even be punished or harmed physically because of our faith in Christ, but some of us might experience that. Some of you may even have already experienced that in your life. Peter, in his letter to the elect exiles, writes to them, and he tells them that Jesus is our example if we ever experience unjust punishment. Not that we can't, if possible, escape from under unjust punishment, but he teaches us not to strike back. 
to do harm in retaliation. Peter says this, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus is our example as well, should that situation befall us. Oh, I pray, church, that we would look to him and that even in situations that don't even come close to what Jesus was experiencing or what some of our brothers and sisters who in the faith around the world who are experiencing now, like in Pakistan or in India or all kinds of other countries around the world. Let us not be people that strike back. Let us take the path of Jesus and walk in his steps. Jesus was and is the true king of the Jews, the one that they were waiting for, and yet the Jews couldn't recognize him because they loved their sin. They loved the darkness. This is King Jesus mocked. Next, we see the innocent king. We see that in verses 4 through 8, the innocent king. In this passage, you might notice that we're moving from inside Pilate's headquarters to outside in front of the jeering Jewish crowd, then back inside, and then finally back outside in the last section. What's emphasized in these verses is that Pilate knows Jesus is innocent and doesn't deserve to be punished, much less crucified. And it seems that Pilate's order for Jesus to receive the lighter lighter form of flogging was a strategy of his, perhaps. Now he brings Jesus out after that flogging, bloodied and beaten with the crown on his head and the purple robe on him. And twice in these verses, four through eight, he tells the crowd, I find no guilt in him. He's innocent. Pilate knows it. And he introduces him to the crowd saying, behold the man. Now, scholars agree that the the tone of this declaration of Pilate is like Pilate saying, look at this pitiful figure of a man. You think he's so dangerous? Look, he's weak and harmless. But the Jews want him crucified, and so they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. He's innocent, and yet he's condemned. Pilate pokes at the Jews then at the end of verse 6. He says, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. But he knows that they don't have the right to crucify him, as we mentioned last week, of course. And so they need the Romans to do it. Finally, in desperation, they call out the true religious reason that they wanted Jesus killed. It's there in verse 7. Did you see it? He ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Ah, there it is. That's the real reason. You may remember back in chapter 10, Jesus said these things to the Jews. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. That's what happened when Jesus made himself equal to God the Father. And that's what they're claiming here. Jesus is the Son of the Father. What He claims is true, of course. He only speaks truth. But because they love the darkness, they love their sin, they declare the true Son of God a blasphemer. The irony is that the law that they're using against Jesus is a law that He gave them. 
He had been the one who had led them out of Egypt through Moses' human leadership and brought them out to Mount Sinai and had made a covenant with them and had given them his law. It was Jesus there. It was Jesus' law. Not one of these Jews could point to any harm that Jesus had done. Instead, he had shown them so much blessing and kindness. He healed the lame and the sick. He, he, fe he fed the crowds. He taught them the truth, freeing them from their false doctrines, trying to lead them away from those false shepherds. Why did they hate him so much? His holiness and the truth that he spoke exposed their sin. Jesus, the innocent King of kings, was condemned for you and I, the true guilty ones. We're the guilty ones. There's not a person here in this room that's not guilty before God. Jesus is the innocent King. That's what we see in those verses. And then we see the obedient King in verses 9 through 11. The obedient King. When the Jews declared that Jesus was making himself the Son of God, verse 8 tells us that Pilate was even more afraid. Now, that's interesting. Many Romans believed that the gods could make themselves appear in the world in some form. It's a, a superstitiousness. And that probably drove Pilate's superstitions about Jesus here. He's suddenly frightened of Jesus. Jesus had already told him last week that his kingdom, at least last week's passage, <laughs> that his kingdom was a heavenly kingdom and not of this world. Pilate's trying to find a way to release Jesus and make the Jews happy. Of course, he's just had an innocent man flogged, <laughs> the king of kings, the only innocent one to have walked the earth. So Pilate is guilty himself. So then Pilate brings Jesus back into his headquarters again and asks him where he is from. But Jesus gave no answer. And again, the words of Isaiah ring in our ears. Like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his frustration, of course, with Jesus, Pilate demands an answer if Jesus really wants him to release him. Look there at verses 10 and 11. These are really important verses because we see Jesus speaking. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So Pilate is claiming that he has authority over Jesus. Jesus doesn't deny that except to tell Pilate that his authority is an authority that's been granted from above, not by Caesar, Jesus means by God. Scripture teaches throughout that government leaders only have power because God has put them in their places of authority. Even rulers who have no regard for God, don't believe in God, or worship false gods, who are in power only because they are in power only because the true God has orchestrated their rule. It's throughout the Word of God. In Daniel 4, chapter 32, Daniel, who is a Jew in exile in Babylon, tells King Nebuchadnezzar, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. If a person is in power, they're in power because God has put them there. So even when wicked kings rule, it is God who's put them in authority, and we must trust that it is for His purposes that He's done this. Now, that doesn't excuse the wickedness of wicked rulers. They will be held accountable. 
The absolute control that God has over the rulers and kings of the earth is just one aspect of what we call the providence of God. The providence of God. He is sovereign and in control. He is provident, even in a world full of sin. Isaiah 40, verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales compared to God. In democratic countries, of course, we can vote to remove a wicked president or a ruler, and even though we know that all rulers are in their positions because God has put them there, we can pray that God would remove them. We should do that if they're doing wickedness. We should ask the Lord, please remove this person. Restrain their evil, Lord. You're the one that put them there. You can stop them. But while we live under them, we must obey them in everything except where they command us to do something or not do something that God has commanded us. Our statement of faith says it this way. We believe that civil government is of divine appointment for the interests and good order of human society and that officials are to be prayed for and conscientiously honored. They are to be obeyed except only in things opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience and the Prince of the kings of the earth. And so the Apostle Paul says in Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Now, you hear us pray for some aspect of the governing authorities every week in the pastoral prayer. We pray for sheikhs and rulers. We pray for chiefs of police. We pray for government people that are in charge of overseeing the churches here in the UAE and many other kinds of leaders. But if the authorities tell us not to preach the gospel or command us to commit sin, we should disobey them and obey the Lord. If there are laws in a country that tell us that we cannot share the gospel with anyone and everyone, we should proceed to share the gospel with anyone and everyone, no matter what comes. The Lord Jesus has told us that. Martin Neomuller was a German pastor who refused to obey the Nazi government that had power leading into World War II. And they were doing great wickedness. They were abusing the Jews of Germany and in all the other countries that they invaded. For that disobedience that Pastor Neil Mueller committed, he was put in jail, and a Christian friend once visited him in jail and urged him to stay silent about the Nazi government abuses. The friend reminded him that if he did stay silent, he could be released. And so the visitor asked him, so why are you in jail? Neil Mueller replied to him, why aren't you in jail? Neil Mueller saw that it was his duty to God to disobey the authorities when it came to the sin that they commanded of him, to turn the blind eye to it. Do you view the governing authorities the way that Scripture does? Do you trust that God is in control even if the leaders of the country that you live in or the country where you're from are, are wicked. Do you pray for them? Will you obey them in all things that aren't contrary to God's commands? And will you honor God, the king over all the earth, if these earthly leaders command you to disobey Christ? It's an important question to think about as a Christian, especially in the region that we live in. Jesus' last statement here is a little bit perplexing. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. It's most likely that Jesus here means Caiaphas and the Jews who have the greater sin for delivering him over to Pilate. Pilate's more of a passive figure here. Pilate hadn't sought Jesus' arrest. Of course, he's seeking some way to release Jesus, 
even though he's, he's done Jesus wrong for sure. None of that means, of course, that Pilate was innocent. What we see above all in these verses is that Jesus, the King of Kings, is being obedient to the plan of God, his Father. God was working out his plan of salvation through the sin of the Jews and the authority of Pilate, even though one day they would be held accountable for it. Once again, of course, we see that both the responsibility of man for his sin, but the power of God to somehow bring good from it and work out his purposes in the midst of it, even through it. The world is a sinful mess and guilty before God, but God is in control and he will make all of history end the way that he has determined. You can be sure of that. Jesus is submitting to the Father's plan, knowing that his obedience in this unjust situation will result in forgiveness of sinners like you and me. It had to be that way. The apostles would one day soon realize what God was doing through his obedient son when they prayed in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, 27 and 28, they say, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. It was their sin. It was God's plan. John Piper says in his book, Providence, without God's providence over wicked authorities, there would be no gospel. The murder of the Son of God is pivotal in providing our salvation. Christ did not die randomly. It was planned. His death was a God-orchestrated travesty of justice that his enemies hoped would get rid of his influence. But in all of that sin and injustice, providence was pursuing the salvation of those who plotted his death and millions, millions more who deserve it, who don't deserve it, rather. The Jews and Pilate will one day stand on trial before Jesus the judge, the one that they unjustly judged. They're guilty. But God was working through their evil plans to accomplish his ultimate good. Brothers and sisters, the providence of God in a sinful world gives us as Christians great comfort. It is a great comfort. Sin cannot ultimately win. Satan will be crushed beneath our feet. It is not as if God is not in control and is just kind of the grand chess player up in the sky who makes a better move no matter what sin does on the other side of the board. No, he is in the midst of all of it. Even as we speak out against injustice or we lament the wickedness in the world, we can trust that God is in control. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 27, you know that verse. No, in all these things, and he's talking about suffering, wickedness, hatred, violence, evil. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us in the midst of all those things. Jesus is the king obeying the Father's plan to save us. Last, we see the rejected king. The rejected king is there in verses 12 through 16. The first sentence of this last section of our passage tells us what Pilate hoped to do. He was seeking to release Jesus. Jesus' innocence was obvious, just as obvious as the unjustified hatred the Jews had for Jesus. But the Jews played an ace in this game of poker with Pilate. If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. If there, anything, if there was anything that could make Pilate wilt under the pressure, it was basically threatening him with being seen as siding against Caesar if he was to release Jesus. I mean, that was a threat to Caesar. I mean, excuse me, to Pilate. 
Caesar could have his head lopped off immediately. If Caesar caught wind of that, it could be Pilate up on the cross next. Fear of man was Pilate's weak spot. Even when the true son of the living God stood before him, he couldn't see it. He chose to act as a friend of Caesar rather than a friend of Jesus. Oh, do you remember Jesus? Jesus had called his disciples his friends. Fear of man rather than fear of God drives so much of our sinful choices, brothers and sisters. What will people think of me? What will it look like if I'm seen doing this or that or not seen doing this or that? If we live to please people, then we cannot and will not please God. We're pleasing ourselves. Brothers and sisters, beware deciding how to live based on what others will think of you. The only way that you'll recognize this is to think deeply about your choices in life. Think deeply. Ask yourself, what am I afraid of others knowing about me or seeing me do? Even good decisions born simply out of fear of what others will think of you are not deeds done to please God. Those are selfish deeds. They're deeds done to keep up appearances. Grow your fear of the Lord and you will be able to make good choices out of faith in God when people are looking and when people aren't looking. That's the question. Who are you when people aren't looking? Sometimes we can even justify our fear of man by hiding behind another command of God, like maybe honor your mother and father. Well, I'm just honoring my mother and father. Ask yourself, are the choices that I'm making both honoring my mother and father and honoring God, my father in heaven? Fear of man will lead you and I to sin. Fear of God will lead us to faith-filled obedience to God. If you're a non-Christian who's been investigating Christianity, faith in the Christ of these pages, maybe you've seen that Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe you understand now that He died and rose again for our sins to be forgiven but you haven't made that decision to turn from your sin and trust in Him. May I ask why? What's keeping you from following Jesus? If you know what I just explained, then you know enough to be a Christian. You know enough to follow Him. Could it be fear of people and how they'll respond to you if you do trust in Him, if you become a Christian? You know, it is really good to count the cost before you follow Jesus, and there will be a cost. But be sure you also consider the cost of not following Jesus. It's a much higher cost, infinitely higher. One day we will all stand before him and the opinions that others have of us will not matter. All that will matter is how you responded to Jesus. Pilate feared man, so he brought Jesus out and he sat him down, he he sat down rather, on the judgment seat. And this is, of course, where the final verdict would be passed. John makes sure to remind us it's the day of preparation before the Passover. He wants us to see this is the Passover lamb. That's what he's whispering to us. Jesus is the mocked, innocent, obedient son of God who is giving himself up as the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Pilate's last statement to the crowd is meant to poke the Jews once again. Behold your king, he says this time. At the beginning of the passage, he announced Jesus as, behold the man, a pitiful, weak-looking person. That was true 
Jesus was the word become flesh, flesh that could bleed, flesh that experienced pain. His glory was hidden by his humble humanity. But Pilate unknowingly spoke a deep truth, didn't he, when he said, behold your king. Jesus is the true king. The king that Israel had been waiting centuries for. The king that these Pharisees should have been the first to recognize. The one who would be bringing blessing and freedom to them if they would only receive him. But they didn't. John 1 verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And so they made their choice known in their cries that day in the crowd Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, says Pilate, last of all? Those are his last words that we have recorded. We have no king but Caesar, said the Jews. Oh, how ironic. We have no king but Caesar. A man who sat on a throne in Rome, who claimed to be divine himself but was not, and died, and is still dead. They rejected the king of glory that God in his grace and kindness had sent to rescue them. They rejected the king of heaven and chose the king of the world in rebellion against God. Many of you know this little booklet, Two Ways to Live. It's a great little explanation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And one thing that I like about this is they have little diagrams to describe the truths of the gospel. It begins and says, God is the loving ruler of the world. He made the world. He made us rulers of the world under him. And it pictures a large crown over a person and the earth. God is the king. Jesus was and is the king. But we all reject the ruler God by trying to run life our own way without him. We fail to rule ourselves or society or the world. And it pictures us with a little crown over our heads. Because that's what we do. Just like the Jews chose Caesar, in effect, what they were doing was they were putting the crown on their own heads. They wanted to rule themselves. God won't let us rebel forever. God's punishment for rebellion is death and judgment. But Christ came into the world sent by God. He always lived under God's rule. And yet by dying in our place, he took our punishment and brought forgiveness. God raised Jesus to life again as the ruler of the world. Jesus has conquered death and now gives new life and will return to judge. And so there are two ways to live. Take the crown for yourself. Rule your own life. Live for you. Or live under Jesus' rule and receive what King Jesus has done for us on the cross. Oh, beloved, do you see the glorious king who was mocked instead of worshiped because we've worshiped God's authority over our lives through our sin? We've mocked God's authority, rather, Do you see the innocent king who went to the cross to take away our guilt? Do you see the obedient king crucified for our disobedience? Do you see the king of kings rejected so that we might be accepted by God the Father as sinless and righteous? Sinlessness and righteousness, that's a gift from him. Behold the man Behold your king, brothers and sisters, Jesus. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for King Jesus. Lord, we were like them. We did not recognize him for who he was, and we had not bowed the knee to him at some point in our lives. And yet for those of us who are Christians, you opened our eyes and we beheld the king 
we beheld the God-man, and you worked in our hearts such that we put our trust and faith in him. We praise you that he paid the penalty for our sin. In Christ's name we pray, amen.